All right. So in this last lesson, lesson number 10 of module 1 of Big Data Hadoop Administration course, we'll be talking about the Hadoop architecture in detail. So let's have a recap of the previous lesson. So in the previous lesson, we have learned some major drives for Hadoop adoption among various sectors of the market. And in this particular session, we'll be focusing on something called HDFS and MapReduce. We'll also have a look at what is master-slave architecture and the different Hadoop deployment modes and a quick look at the Hadoop ecosystem. So if you look at Hadoop uh, from an architectural point of view, you can see that there are two major parts of Hadoop. There is something called HDFS or the Hadoop Distributed File System. Now the Hadoop Distributed File System is primarily responsible for storing the data. And the second part is called MapReduce. Now MapReduce is responsible for processing the data. So in a nutshell, you can say that Hadoop equals storage plus processing. Now the key point that you need to understand here is that in every Hadoop cluster, you will have master machines and slave machines. Now in terms of HDFS, there will be a master machine who handles the storage and slave machines who offer raw storage. In terms of MapReduce, there will be a master machine who accepts your programs and are distributed and slave machines who will be doing the processing part of that. However, Hadoop is actually a combination of HDFS and MapReduce. Now, if you look at uh, the Hadoop architecture in detail, you can see that under HDFS or the Hadoop Distributed File System, which takes care of storage, you have three demands, or I can say you have three different types of machines who are running the storage portion. Now, the master machine here is called the name node. The name node is actually responsible for metadata storage. Now, imagine a situation where you have one name node and 100 slaves. Now, the slave nodes are called data nodes. They offer raw storage. So, when you say that in your Hadoop cluster, you have 100 machines who offer their hard disk for storage, you technically mean that you have 100 data nodes. Now, when I say that, what happens is that, let's say you try to copy some data to a Hadoop cluster. Now, whenever you're copying data to a Hadoop cluster, name node is the master demon who talks to the data nodes and come back to you with a list of data nodes where you can store the data. Because every data node offers storage, however, there might be situations wherein some of the data nodes will be already full, some might be overutilized, some may be underutilized. So to avoid such a problem, the name node intervenes and whenever you want to write some data, the name node will say that, hey, you can write the data on these particular data nodes. And also the data is broken down into multiple blocks and stored in a distributed manner across the cluster. So imagine you have a hundred data nodes in a cluster and you wish to store a file of, let's say, 500 uh, uh, megabytes. Now the 500 megabyte file will not be stored as a single file. Rather, it will be divided into multiple blocks. Now in Hadoop 2, by default, the block size is 128 megabytes. So your 512 megabytes data, imagine you're storing 512 megabytes of data, a single file, will be broken down into four modules or four chunks of 128 MB and each chunk or we can say each block will be stored on a particular data node. So the data is divided and spread across the cluster. Now you also have a demand called the secondary name node 
Well, the secondary name node is kind of a, a standby machine and it is not a hot standby machine. In case the primary name node goes down, the secondary node, name node can take its place, but manual intervention and configuration is required. Also, the secondary name node is used for a function called checkpointing, where you periodically take a backup of the whole metadata. So here you can see the overall architecture of Hadoop. Now as you can see, you have the name node and secondary name node who are the masters of the storage domain or the HDFS. They are connected to the slaves who are running the daemon called data node. Now you also have another master machine called job tracker. Now the job tracker is a specific daemon which is associated with Hadoop version 1. So in Hadoop version 1, what happens is that let's imagine that you submit a program to analyze the data inside a Hadoop cluster. The program will be going to this job tracker. Now, as you can see, you have something called task tracker. Now, task trackers are available on every data node. Now, the slave machines like in our example that I discussed before, a 100 node cluster, if you are having 100 machines who offer storage, there will be 100 task trackers also running on the same machine. Now, the primary idea behind a task tracker is that it is a daemon which will be communicating to the master daemon called job tracker. So whenever the job tracker has any program to be executed, on the given data set, it will invoke the task trackers on the data nodes wherever the data is lying and the task trackers will execute the program for you. So to summarize this, since your data is spread across the cluster, if you want to analyze the data, you must invoke the individual task trackers on whichever data nodes where you have your parts of the data. So that speaks about the architecture of Hadoop. Uh, here we discuss about the different deployment modes of Hadoop. Now, since Hadoop is a framework, there are three ways in which you can install Hadoop in uh, a system. Now, one more key point here is that all these three modes are not heavily used. For example, the first mod is called a standalone or local mod. In standalone mod, there are no demands. Everything runs on a single Java virtual machine. Standalone mode is suitable only for running MapReduce programs during development. It is one of the least used environments. So when I say that you are installing Hadoop in something called a standalone mode, understand that the entire Hadoop is getting installed only on a single machine. You cannot expand more than a machine. So from that itself, you can assume that this is not a mode which we use in production. Then why do you use the uh, certain standalone mode is if you are a developer, then you can use standalone mode to simulate the Hadoop environment on a single box. However, all the demands will be running inside a single Java virtual machine. So the standalone mode is not practically much used in day to day life of a Hadoop developer. The second mode is called the pseudo distributed mode and this is the mode which will be mostly used by all the developers and throughout our course we will be demonstrating almost all the aspects using the pseudo distributed mode. In pseudo distributed mode you can install the Hadoop on a single machine and you can simulate the entire Hadoop cluster on a single machine. Now why do we prefer the pseudo distributed mode is that being a developer, you might want to test a sample program that you might have written. Now, if you have some sample data and the program that you have written, you can simulate an entire Hadoop cluster on a single machine, try out your code, and if it works successfully, then you can implement it on a practical cluster. And that is the reason we are using the pseudo distributed mode. It is mostly used for testing and heavily used by all the developers. 
Now the last mod is called the fully distributed mod and this is the mod that we actually see in prediction. In fully distributed mod you can have the Hadoop demons separately on the machines depending on the role they play. For example, if you have 100 machines and you have one of the machines configured as the name node, then only the name node daemon will be running on that machine. Now, if you have configured the another machine as a data node, then only the data node and task tracker daemon will be running there. So, in this particular mode, a cluster of machines will be set up in the master-slave architecture to distribute and process the data across various nodes of commodity hardware. There are separate masters and separate slaves in this uh, distribution. This mode is usually used in production environment like I discussed, where we have n number of machines forming a Hadoop cluster. Last but not least, let's have a look at the Hadoop ecosystem. Now we have seen the Hadoop ecosystem in the previous lesson uh, and let me give you a quick one-liner idea about the tools that you can use in a Hadoop ecosystem. Now as we have seen, uh, HDFS uh, is the storage part of Hadoop which comes by default with Hadoop. You have something called YARN which is yet another resource negotiator which comes by default with Hadoop too. YARN is used for the entire resource management of the cluster. Then you have a Flume. You can use the tool called Flume to store and analyze streaming data. Uh, the next tool is called Scoop. Scoop is used to connect and transfer data between Hadoop and RDBMS systems. You have Zookeeper which is more towards the administration side which handles things such as high availability. Uh, OZ is a workflow scheduler wherein you can couple multiple workflows and maybe uh, you can type in your own rules as to which process should happen at what time. Uh, Pig is and Pig Latin is a scripting language which we use to write codes inside Hadoop and Mahout is used for machine learning, R for analytics, Hive for data warehousing. HBase is a classic example for the NoSQL database that we can use inside Hadoop. So to wrap up in this particular lesson, we have learned the uh, HDFS and MapReduce of Hadoop. We also saw what is master-slave architecture and the different modes of installation of Hadoop. That's all for this lesson. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to raise a support ticket. Thank you.